Shalom to each of you here on the Zoom call and those who will watch this class lecture on YouTube later. Our usual program during these talks is to conduct an overview of the Bible section in the first 25 minutes and then let everyone on the call into a conversation about all the themes or ideas that I'll bring up for the last 30 minutes or so. Further discussion happens even deeper in our D groups that happen over the next week and maybe some will conduct a D group on Shabbat. I'm going to recommend that you who are watching this on YouTube should read the next three chapters of the Bible before you listen or watch the rest of this. They're chapters 10, 11, and 12. Then press play on your machine and rejoin us. We saw how this book breaks into three major geographic and chronological sections. The first was found in the first 10 chapters. Geographically, we were at Sinai at the time. Today in our fifth class, we move out from Sinai into the second section of the book, which takes up the bulk of the book, traveling from Sinai, going to Moab, just outside the land of Israel. Then it was called Canaan. Some of you are new to our Zoom call, and I especially welcome you, whether here in Australia or from overseas. You're muted just now at the beginning, but in a short while, our host will allow the usually lively conversations and questions. Today's study, it is called Kvetching 2.0. First, exit stage left. The Jewish people have been here at Mount Sinai for a year, and all of a sudden the cloud lifts and it's time to move. We have an order to fulfill, and that's to get to the promised land. And whenever the cloud lifts, we've been instructed, we gather up our gear and head out in an orderly fashion. Three tribes to the east, three to the north, etc. The Levites break down the tabernacle, and they carry the furniture carefully. It's all laid out in our previous chapters here in the book Bamidbar. How we're to march and with whom. Even the pennant we're to carry in each sector of the tribes. It's military. That makes sense to us who watch Canberra or Duntroon or the Israeli Defense Force. But think about this. All this army a year before were slaves to Pharaoh. We had no military training. We had no officers except taskmasters. And now we're a military force? <laughs> That's downright laughable. Even so, God had us march like an army. I think back to when I was in school and the teachers, the alarm would go off. We had a fire drill. The teachers would march us one way or another. If we had a tornado drill, uh, in my case, uh, we had to process uh, this march in a different fashion to a certain place, stand at the ready, or pull ourselves under a desk, etc. The guidance made us little folks into an army of a sort. That's what I see in the text today. So chapter 10 ends with our mobilization and our marching. But wait a minute, the text says in verse 29, then Moses said to Chovav, the son of Ruel, the Midianite, Moses' father-in-law, We are setting out to the place of which the Lord said, I will give it to you. Come with us, and we'll do you good, for the Lord has promised good concerning Israel. I'm surprised at this. Maybe you are too. The Jewish men numbered 600,000 or so. And that didn't count the women and children under 20 years old, including teenagers. Moses is inviting his relative, mind you, not his ancestor, but an in-law to join the Jewish people. Either it's Ruel or Jethro, his father-in-law, or it's Chovav, his brother-in-law, as it seems to say in our text. Either way, he's not a Jew. And either way, we've got enough trouble already, don't we? But Moses knows that our journey is going to be tough. Remember, Moses is 81 years old. His siblings are older yet. They're going to lead the people. Moses had spent 40 of his years in that same wilderness through which they're now going to travel. 
That's half his life. Moses knows the terrain and the difficulties. He also has begun to learn about the Jewish people <laughs> from whom he was separated for really 80 years. And so he's just beginning to understand the Sitzim Laban, the thinking, the manner, who we are as Jews. And he's beginning to understand our response to problems in life. We aren't exactly the most agreeable sort. That will come out clearly in the next few chapters. If you have a tough job ahead of you and you have some tough folks with whom you need to deal, why would you bring others along? Well, the text tells us that Moses was looking for guidance from others. Others who knew the area, even though the cloud and fire, remember the pillar that would lead us, it would lead the people. There are other issues in setting up camp, in rounding up water, in feeding cattle, etc. The Chobab would know. Even so, Chobab seems to have declined to travel along. You hear that in the text here, but it's not so. He actually did travel with the Jewish people. Look at Judges chapter 1, verse 16, and Judges chapter 4, verse 11, and we see that Chovav did join the Jewish people. And also we learn that Chovav is another name of Jethro, Moses' father-in-law. So I'll let some squabble about father-in-law, son-in-law, brother-in-law. That's not the point. The point is not exactly which relative is he. The point is that this one who was like a local guide could really help when we traveled through the wilderness. My wife and I climbed Mount Kilimanjaro some years ago, and it is not allowed for a person to ascend, to get even onto the mountain unless you have a local guide. They don't want to have dead people up and down the mountainside. And so it is that Moses was smart to take this man with him. But he didn't just take him. My takeaway, though, from this text is that when we are called to go to serve God, to follow the Lord, that we're also encouraged to bring others along. That might be why so many of us in this Zoom call or who watch this lesson later are interested in evangelism. We want others to join us. What we have, as Moses says, is good for Israel. The goodness, this is how he's talking to Chobab, the goodness with which Hashem will benefit us, we will do good to you. Look, four times in this two-verse section, Moses uses the term, in one form or another, of tov, to remind us that the plan of God is tov, it's good. Going forward is good. What's ahead is good. God is good. Amen? So, Chovab, join us, please. And he did. That's good. Look how chapter 10 ends with this marvelous prayer asking God to arise and scatter the enemies. Kumo Adonai mipanecha. We used to sing this in synagogue every time the Torah was taken out of the ark. Uh, it's a prayer of confidence in the Lord. Moses prays this. It eventually became part of the Jewish prayer landscape as in Psalm 68. And as I said, every time we would take out the Torah. Arise, O Lord, but that's the Torah. So we associate God with the words of God. Prayer, and specifically praise, is the antidote to what will come next. Fetching 2.0. Chapter 11, however, introduces a new theme in the text we didn't announce earlier. It's the theme of complaining. In Yiddish, kvetching. This comes from a German word, to squeeze or to pinch, and has morphed over time into a simple word for complaining. It's also endemic to our Jewish world. The man says, I had an aunt who spent half her life trying to figure out where the draft came from in the house. People tell the obvious, for instance, in a rainstorm. 
If you go out, I guarantee you, you'll get soaked. They bring illness into it. Are you looking to get pneumonia? When it rains hard, they make it sound as if it were an assassin's target. Oh my gosh, I didn't think I'd make it from the car to the house. And of course, then you drag God into it. A few more days of this and we'll have to build an ark. A waiter in St. Kilda was so tired of the Jewish ladies who always came in and fetched. They had something, some reason to send their soup back to the, to the chef. This happened every week. One time he saw them coming in after they were seated. He approached them and said, hello, ladies, is anything all right? That's the association with fetching. Look, chapter 11 is not the first time we as Jews complained. Remember back in Egypt, we complained about the food, about the conditions of slavery, about the toil itself, and that God psh, didn't seem to hear us. Even when we approached the Red Sea, after being miraculously delivered, we complained about the sea itself. Moses, you madman, why did you bring us out here to die? There's no food, there's no nothing. We had it better back in Egypt. How soon we forget how bad it was, you know? So here in the wilderness, we complain, and with good reason, we think. Verse 1 of chapter 11 is one that gets translated very differently in different versions. I'll be interested to hear what your version says after this lecture part of the class. This one says, Now the people became like those who complain of adversity in the hearing of the Lord. And when the Lord heard it, dot, dot, dot. God doesn't take kindly to the complaining of his people. Paul, the rabbi from Tarsus, would later tell us, Do all things without grumbling, complaining, or disputing. That's in Philippians. Some version of the Bible uh, some versions of the Bible say here in verse 1 that the people complain due to hardships. The Hebrew is the word ra, meaning evil. And one Hebrew English text renders this. It says, the people took to seeking complaints. It was evil in the eyes of the Lord. I like that. The complaining itself was evil or ra or bad in God's eyes. He had promised us good. He's promised to care for us. And he had done so for the last two years. But now we're angry again. The root of complaining is deservedness. I think I deserve something. God or you don't give it to me. So I complain. I'm aggravated and I want more. And you don't give it to me. I complain. Kvetch, kvetch, kvetch. It's not a good look for anyone. And specifically, there was a group that joined in the complaining. Look at it in verse 4. Asaf Suf it is. That's the one used, it's one time used here in the Bible. That makes a word hard to translate. These are, it's translated in most of the versions I have as mixed multitude. This is verse 4. Uh, maybe they were the Egyptians who left Egypt in the Exodus, who put blood on the door and escaped the punishment of the death of the firstborn. So, Asaf Suf. Asaf Suf. Asaf Suf. It sounds like an onomatopoeia, like riffraff, like the complaining that they would bring. Uh, think of the tares in the parable Yeshua taught, who were allowed to grow up with the wheat. Uh, look, these are the ones who cop the fire of the Lord right here. Fire of the Lord comes first to the edges, it says, of the people. Wow. By the way, fire can be the lightning or a bushfire. Uh, we don't know. It'll be something like that. So the fetching causes God's unhappiness and his anger. The riffraff complained about the manna only diet without meat. Pfft, great. You bring us out here and all we get is this mana. Mana is one of those words that means, what is this? That's, that's what it means. 
That's how they named it. When I was a kid, I learned that the manna could be anything you wanted it to be. Now, that doesn't make any sense, but that's what the rabbis taught me when I was a youth, that it, if you wanted it to taste like steak, it would taste like steak. If you wanted it to taste like vegetable soup, so it was, whatever it was. But if that were so, then the people wouldn't complain that all they had was manna. No, they are in this text, look at what it says, they're, they're remembering the full grocery stores back in Egypt, as if. Look, rose-colored glasses, to be sure. No, we had everything we ever wanted. <laughs> no, it was more like what happened right after COVID hit and people ran to the grocery stores and emptied the stores. And if you went in the next day, good luck. You couldn't find, you couldn't find meat. You couldn't find flour. You couldn't find toilet paper. That's what really was there in the grocery stores of Egypt, if you will. Verse 10, in Moses's eyes, these actions are, what does it say? Bad. In verse 11, Moses prays and God is accused of doing bad to Moses by giving Moses the mandate to lead the people. Not a good thing. I mean, if we're, <laughs> realize this, good and bad are contrasted. Moses says sort of a rebuke to God, almost an I told you so. In verses three, uh, uh, sorry, in Exodus three and four, he had all these excuses why he shouldn't be the one to go deliver the Jewish people. And in this section of Bamidbar, he's basically saying the same thing. I'm not the one. I told you I wasn't the one. Why'd you dump these people on me? Moses is in despair. I think as an 81 year old looking around at the requirements of what's next, he's, he's not a happy camper. So what's God's answer? Verse 16, God says, I need you to go appoint 70 men, successors, if you will, the beginnings of what would be the Sanhedrin. And Moses reports this to the people to quiet them in a way to include them, to make things better. Then Eldad and Medad prophesy, and the people are upset. Well, Joshua is. These are obviously part of the 70, these two and the 68, but these two are doing something a little different. So Joshua wanted to keep the show to their own club. And Moses said, I wish everyone would prophesy. That's, friends, where I am today. Let's let everyone get in on speaking God's words. Protectionism is not our calling. Prophesying, making God's name known among the Jews, among others, in Australia, in America, in New Zealand, wherever and whenever we can. Let's let everyone everywhere proclaim the name of the Lord. Would that all God's people would prophesy, as Moses says. And then, oh wait, you wanted meat? <laughs> Verse 31 and following shows that God was listening to the prophecies of the 70 and the complaints of the people, which is marvelous and just amazes me about God. He's already said, I'm going to give you manna. The people fetch and he adjusts his plans. God is ever negotiable, if you will. He listens to our cries. He wants us to have a blessed day, a blessed month, a blessed life. So what did he do? He says, you want, you want meat? Buckle your seatbelt. Here comes some quail. And the meat came in a flurry. The quails abounding up to a, like a meter above the ground, thick as thieves, as we say here. And then a plague ensued. <sighs> Not a good day. You want, you want complaining to God? God will answer your complaints. You may get what you ask for. That may not be the best idea. Let God be God and not you be God. That's probably a good idea. We who are now living here in Australia know the grace of God in in terms of this plague that's currently on the land, that's currently in the airplanes, that's currently across America and Europe and across the globe. The pandemic called COVID-19 is this plague to which we have to respond. You have to respond right where you are. And God 
can respond wherever he is. So what's the antidote to our fetching, to our receiving of a plague? It's thankfulness for the good that God has given us. Kuma Adonai, arise, O Lord, and let your enemies be scattered. But what happens next? And this I have to use my glasses for, because in chapter 12, we see, we see it hitting close to home. Moses, Aaron, and Miriam were established by God. And Miriam had actually led the singing. I mean, think back, Miriam had actually led Moses out of the, the brook, out, out of not the Nile, but probably a tributary of the Nile or even just a little, a little safe haven there. So she was seriously involved in her kid brother's life. And now she wants to complain. She's the leader of, if you will, a family rebellion in verses uh, one to three. And Miriam complains about the wife. It's probably, it may be Tzipporah, it may be a second wife, we don't know. And uh, she's complaining, saying, who made you the boss? Who, who made you the spokesman for God? And I guess that's a steady theme throughout the scripture. Um, when Moses himself was uh, there at his 40, when he was 40 years old and he saw the Egyptian uh, beating up on a Jewish person, you remember this from early Exodus, and Moses kills the Egyptian. And the next day he sees two Jewish people uh, beating one beating up on the other. And Moses says, uh, hey, stop this, you know, and they say, what are you going to do? You're going to, you're going to kill us like you killed the Egyptian? Hey, who made you a judge and a ruler over us? That theme, who made you the boss, is going to, it's just perpetual from the Jewish people. And now Miriam starts singing that song. And so what does God do? He brings a swift judgment on her by bringing leprosy on her. That's not a good thing. She's afflicted with it. And Moses, amazingly, hears the response of his older brother, Aaron, to intercede for Miriam. And get this, in verses 11 to 13, we have sinned. Aaron admits it, that we have sinned. We've done wrong. And what does God do? He heals Miriam, though she has to stay outside for seven days. I love this about God, that there are consequences to our evil. And dear friends, there are consequences to our good. God is good. He wants us to live in his goodness. He wants us to know his pleasure. He wants you to know that today. Stay with us during these weeks and learn with the, the others how you can stay on track in 2020 and 2021 and beyond. And in the D, D groups, the discipleship groups, you will work this out with others as a community on the march. If you've not yet joined a weekly discipleship group, please reconsider that and join us as we dig deeper. I hope to see you next Friday, 10 a.m. Sydney time, as we study chapters 13 and 14 and learn about our first visit to Kadesh Barnea and the episodes of great significance that happened there. I'll hope to see you then. And until then, please guard your lips from fetching. Learn to thank God and shout hallelujah to the Lord of life for all he has done for us. Shabbat Shalom.